first year of college was at Southern Utah University. Uh, for a while, she worked for Clark Planetarium. Um, she is uh, a NASA uh, Solar System Ambassador for Utah and Arizona, mostly Arizona. Uh, she is the Visitor Science Center Manager for the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory, which is 40 miles from the Mexican border. Public Affairs Officer for the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. Uh, she previously worked in education and exhibits with museums and planetariums and in publicity for satellite and mobile technologies. Um, she is a uh, high or, or, or Sias Rex mission ambassador, a senior instructor, instructional specialist at the University of Arizona Sky Center, and a light pollution and dark skies protection expert. Uh, Amy holds a bachelor's degree in communication from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and a master's degree in museum studies from the University of Oklahoma. So if you could just maybe tell us a little more about yourself. And, That's oh, pretty and also, <laughs> also <laughs> want to say yeah, thank you very much for supporting <laughs> So help me, help me welcome Amy. John Barentine, is that who you met? No, uh, there's this guy named, uh, what was his name? Ryan Andreessen, okay. who spoke with us, and he okay. arranged for those. I will be happy to bother him later. So. They're in Tucson, um, and I'm located just south of Tucson, so I'm happy to bother them. Also, um, I'm not, you'll eventually encounter Betty Maya Foote, um, oh. if you're not already familiar with her. She's also from Utah. Her, yeah. Yeah, she's from all around Utah. She's now the director of education outreach for Okay, I don't, I'm sorry, when I was mentioning Ann Drakeson, he's the one that spoke, but I don't remember exactly who I sent the email to. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I'll try. <laughs> but I we would like that. to become officially associated, and we think it's a wonderful project. Well, I'll make another plug for IDA. Um, any of you who are interested, the next IDA general meeting is in Tucson this year, so not that far away. It's about an 11 hour drive um, from here. So, uh, you know, everyone is welcome to come. I am speaking today, so <laughs> come watch me <laughs> uh, talk about light pollution. Is that in November? It is. It's November 8th and 9th. That's a, I hope. That's a Friday and a Saturday, right? <laughs> um, well, you guys have learned an awful lot about me. I'm a very busy lady in Arizona. Um, you said tell other things about myself. I have two cats. They're mad because I'm gone a lot. <laughs> I have two chinchillas. They don't care. Um, hands up. Uh, you can also see up here I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona. I'm getting my um, doctorate in out of school learning. So my PhD is in education uh, policy and legislation with focus on filling gaps in education for disparately served populations who don't have access to STEM resources. That is, a, that is where my focus is. My job makes it really easy to do that dissertation. So I am working full time more than full time, <laughs> and doing my dissertation at the same time. This is a nice break. So um, I'll give you a little bit of a primer on how it works. Uh, I work for the Smithsonian Institution, and I am part of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. We are partnered to Harvard Observatory. I also work for them. So my life is sort of split in two directions. I am their public affairs officer for the entire Center for Astrophysics. And then I am the visitor and science center manager just for the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory, which is just one site in a very large catalog that I will rail off to you in just a moment here. But <laughs> so the, the roadmap really for today, um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about some big discoveries we've made over the last six months. We've published yeah, just shy of 400 papers in the last six months, so I'm not going to tell you about all of them or I would need like 400 hours. Yeah, that's uh, right. are, are you referring to Harvard Smithsonian altogether? Or? Uh, Center for Astrophysics. Astrophysics, okay. The Center for Astrophysics. And I will actually show you how to access those papers um, for the most part. Sometimes we write them so fast and they are accepted for publication so fast that there's no draft access. But for those that we do have draft access for, I'll show you exactly how to get to them. So you can, and you can check up on us and anybody else you want to. And the one big thing, and I feel like most everybody in the room should know from um, observatories, we're not hiding information. 
right? So we want everyone to have that information. And a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about, some of them I can point you directly to where you can replicate exactly what any of my scientists did. You can read their paper, go into a catalog and replicate everything they just did. Um, so, except for the Hubble Space Telescope, which would be really special to get time on, on that particular instrument, but any cataloged data you can access it. Um, so that's pretty interesting, I think, for everyone. We, uh, Whipple Observatory, for example, you can come take a tour. I'm not gonna hide anything from you. I will hand you the Kepler cam, which I will talk about, and I'll say, here, hold this, don't drop it. <laughs> um, it will probably still be attached to the telescope, and we'll talk about why that happens. So I'm gonna give you a little overview of our headquarters um, and all of the things that we own. We can't, again, talk about all of them because there's too many of them. And I haven't even worked on all of them yet. I technically work in the optical and infrared division and at Harvard University as a Smithsonian employee. So there's that confusion again <laughs> um, for everyone. But uh, I'll give you an overview of just a small group of our telescopes and what we've been involved in. Um, Joe's already seen the whole presentation. I just slammed through it in front of him. Uh, I memorized it. <laughs> he memorized the whole thing. <laughs> he has lots of good questions waiting. Yeah. And then we'll talk about just some of those big things that they've accomplished. So things that I have uh, taken the time to write a press release about. Uh, let's see. So, uh, our why am I doing that? Hold this. Okay. Uh, our headquarters is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So you guys probably guessed that um, at Harvard University. And the consortium between Harvard and FAO was created in 1973. And they did that to bring together all of the best resources um, that we had because FAO already had the Whipple Observatory. So Fred Lawrence Whipple had already established uh, Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory. He already had a gamma ray telescope. Uh, he was already doing heavy amounts of research. The first volume of his work, about 65 papers, uh, had already been published by the time that the consortium was fully aligned. Uh, so I don't want to forget any of these, so I'm actually going to read them off to you. No, I'm not. I'm going to ruin everything. <laughs> um, I shouldn't be allowed to touch presentations. So we have the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory in Amato, Arizona. I'll actually talk to you about how many telescope projects are there individually because we are multiple observatories in one site. The Magellan Telescopes um, on Las, um, Cerro Las Campanas in Chile. The Giant Magellan Telescope, which is being constructed at Las Campanas. The MMT Observatory, which is located at the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory in Amato. The PanStar on Haleakala and Maui. The Submillimeter Array on Mauna Kea. The South Pole Telescope in Antarctica. The 1.2 meter millimeter wave telescopes that are located in Cambridge and Chile and they work together and communicate. The Veritas Gamma Ray Array, which is located in Amato, Arizona, at my facility. And then the CTA, which is the Cherenkov Telescope Array, which will be constructed in the Atacama Desert. And the prototype Short Shield Kube Telescope for that array is also at my site in Amato, Arizona. And that's just ground-based telescopes. We also have a significant number of space-based telescopes. Does anybody know what some of them are? <coughs> I don't know, but you mentioned the Hubble. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we use Hubble quite a lot, but we are not on the science team for Hubble. So we, are, we do house the science team for the Chandra mission. Uh, we house half of the science team for the Parker Solar Probe. Um, the rest of them are at APL at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we also have had teams for Spitzer, Kepler, Hess, High Node, uh, there's some others on here. <laughs> like solar dynamics, uh, the list <coughs> can go on forever. Um, we also have one in proposal right now called the Whipple Project, uh, which will be space-based and do some things relatively similar to the JWST. So maybe we'll get there first. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna talk about that telescope in a minute too, not because we're working on it, but because it's holding some things up. Uh, so. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about uh, is the submillimeter array uh, at Mauna Kea. And does anybody know about this telescope? It's fairly young. Uh, telescope, I mean the array. These telescopes, you do, I think. So, go ahead. I uh, just read that they've been coming online over the last couple of years and that there's still mm -hmm. more work to be done. Yeah, so right now there are eight <clears throat> six meter radio telescopes uh, at this site. It's at about 13,390 feet in elevation. 
It was first, we first started constructing this site in 2004. It's the world's first uh, imaging interferometric telescope array. It's a pathfinder for ALMA. So is everyone here uh, familiar with ALMA? It's in the Atacama Desert. It's a very similar 16, array. 16,000 feet. Yes. They have, a, they have a little more elevation, less air um, than we do. But so what it does is it explores the universe by detecting light waves or colors that the human eye cannot see. And you may have been familiar with this or heard about it just because it was involved in the Deep Impact mission in 2005, just as it started to come online at the very beginning. Does anyone remember Deep Impact uh, to Comet Temple? Or uh, then we sent a projectile out there and we exploded it and then it turned into more vapor than anyone possibly thought it could have turned into. And I was really excited about that because it was a good distraction from you know, college uh, back when I was getting my bachelor's degree. But you're probably more familiar uh, with something that the submillimeter array has been involved in in recent news. And this is not going to participate. So along with the South Pole Telescope, and this is actually an image of ALMA here, um, mm. but and several other telescopes around the world, including one in Arizona. Um, April 10th of 2019, yeah. if that rings a bell for anybody. The black, <laughs> uh, the black hole. So <laughs> yes, I'm sure everybody remembers. So we pointed all the telescopes together and we looked out an elliptical galaxy about 55 million years ago. And we looked right into the center of that galaxy to get the first image ever of a black hole. I'm sorry, we'll let it be all dramatic. Flashbacks even of uh, image mode. This was a really big day for us uh, and for everybody else, so we won't take that away from um, the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona was also involved, so, so a really, really huge day for me um, and all of the observatories that I am involved with. So many hundreds of scientists worked on this project uh, worldwide, even those who didn't have a telescope involved were on these teams. I think there were about a thousand scientists total who did work on the data. Uh, just for this project. Uh, this project also has been observing Sagittarius A, which is an astronomical radio source that could enter the Milky Way galaxy. So I don't have awesome video of that. But. So this is where I work. Uh, I hope this doesn't give anyone an epileptic seizure. But this is a drone <laughs> video and it was kind of windy that day. We do get snow there. Uh, this observatory, parts of it are located at about 8,600 feet in elevation. So even though we're located in the middle of the Sonora Desert, just north of Mexico, we get plenty of snow. We got about six feet of snow in two days uh, last year in just under 48 hours. So we were first established, which is uh, as a, an official observatory in 1968. And today we have 29 total telescopes, but we have about six more coming. And so those telescopes, I'm going to give you sort of a brief overview because we don't get to talk about all of them, but I am the project manager for the micro observatory uh, here, uh, here in Arizona, and there is a project uh, manager in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They are NASA based, but they're for public use. What, 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 excuse me, what do you mean by micro? So they're called the Micro Observatory because they're about this tall um, off the ground. There's two of them. We're getting a third one for solar observing. Uh, it's actually, I think, in my office right now, my boss called to tell me to get all the boxes out of his office <laughs> on Friday when I get back to work. So it, it's in my office. I'll be installing it in the desert um, probably next week. So we'll have three telescopes out there, and you can use them. Anyone can use them. If you Google Micro Observatory, you're more than welcome to put your requests in the queue, and there is software for manipulating those images uh, through different filters. Anybody can use them. Lots of kids in Saudi Arabia really love to use those. What, what is the uh, diameter? Six, uh, so the new one is a little different. The small ones are six inch telescopes. And they're all off the shelf built. So the solar telescope was built in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, the, the other guy's name is Frank Sinkowicz and he built me the solar telescope in his office. So here, we're very lucky. Uh, up here, this is about 7,800 feet in elevation. But if you notice, what's not out here? Cities. So there's not a lot nearby. So Nogales, Arizona is our nearest city. That's about a good 35, 40 minute drive away from our observatory. 
and it's an hour from our base camp to the top of our mountain. So we are really very lucky because our boreal scale measurement, which Doug will learn a lot about, um, when you're talking about light pollution, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with this, uh, we're about a two. So we've been heavily protected with the state of Arizona, at least in southern Arizona, let's not count Phoenix, it's its own country. Uh, has a lot of very strict lighting policies. In fact, the city that I live in, I live in a place called Rio Rico, but I live in Rio Rico Northeast. There is one street light in my neighborhood, <laughs> and it is a sodium street light, and when it burns out, they're not replacing it. So they've already decided not to replace it. There will be no street lights um, in that city. And there are a lot of dark sky communities in this area. Everyone protects our facility, so we're excellent, and especially for what we are well known for, which is gamma ray. Astronomy. We are the birthplace of gamma ray astronomy, and we hope to continue to be a very um, important vestiture for that in the future. So compared to Mount Lemmon, uh, and I did talk to you about that, I work at the Sky Center, that's usually a five or a six on the Bortle scale. That means they are three times brighter and then we are because they're just above Tucson. You look down into Tucson, um, which is really unfortunate, although it can look really cool. If you ever go there, it's a pretty beautiful place. So. At our facility, we have, like I said, the 29 telescopes. There are four gamma ray telescopes that are in an array at base camp called Veritas. And we'll talk about them at the very, very end. There is the CTA Schwarzschild Cudet, which is actually a secondary and primary uh, mirror system for gamma ray telescopes. So it completely changed everything. You think about, um, is anyone in here familiar with gamma ray? Okay, you guys, so any images you might have seen would make you feel like someone stuck their thumb in blue food coloring and smeared it on the windshield of a car. Okay. Uh, the Schwarzschild Coudé uh, goes from 500 pixels to almost 12,000 pixels, and it looks like a grain of rice. Um, so we can actually mm -hmm. see those particles um, almost as a particle now. <coughs> so we have very little feedback in that. It's very, very, very cool. We're still working on it. A genius at UCLA figured it out. And he took the Schwarzschild Coudé model, actually is 114 years old, and he modified it for gamma ray use. It's big, it's heavy, please come to my facility and look at it, it's very awesome. So then uh, we have the micro observatory are also located at base camp, and then up here at the ridge, uh, which is this complex you can see here, you can see this eyeball right here, that is part of Minerva, and Minerva has five telescopes in it, it's for exoplanetary research. Uh, over here is the M Earth, which is also looking for exoplanets. We do a lot of exoplanetary research. And then you've got some domes. Uh, oh, that's not an eyeball. The eyeball's over here. I'm sorry, I can't see what I'm looking at. These are all domes. <laughs> this used to have a telescope in it. It has a new one coming. And these are our 1.2 and 1.5 meter telescopes uh, right there. And then we'll talk about those in about 10 seconds. And then up at the very, very top is our crown jewel, which is the 6.5 meter optical MMT observatory, which used to be six mirrors that were 1.4 meters. And it's, uh, it was the very first mirror that ever came out of the mirror lab at the University of Arizona. It was at one point the largest uh, optical imaging telescope when it still had its six small mirrors. Now it's the 14th largest. And as soon as TMT, a couple others in Japan, and the giant Magellan are done, it will get significantly smaller. If you consider the MMT is 6.5 meters in diameter. If any of you have heard anything about the giant Magellan, each of those mirrors is 8.4 meters wide, and there are seven of them on the giant Magellan telescope. So it is the exact same model that the MMT used to be, only at that scale. Um, they have to be 8.4 because that's what we are legally allowed to drive down the freeway. So that is the uh, width that those mirrors will ever be in the United States of America. We have to get it down the freeway uh, all the way to Corpus Christi, put it on a barge, and then take it down the Panama Canal at some juncture to get it to where it has to go. And 8.4 was the magic number. <laughs> all right, so um, at night, uh, these are what our, this is what our 1.2 meter telescope looks like. The 1.5 meter is almost identical. But what is really wonderful about the 1.2 meter telescope is that it's actually a piece of Pyrex. Um, it is our original mirror, and someone cast it out of Pyrex glass and then coated it and stuck it in there. We've never had to replace it. We recoat it occasionally, but it has remained one of the most amazing things that we have. And 
These are both optical reflectors, and so that's why I've only got the one image here because I can sort of talk about them with just one, one image. They're used for solar system, galactic, and extragalactic studies. Um, right now, there's someone up there observing doing metallicity studies on stars. And the 1.2 meter is, that's 48 inches for those of you who don't do meters. Uh, in southern Arizona, we are on the metric system. Even our roads are on the metric system. So we'll talk a lot about meters today. But at 48 inches, it's primarily for optical imaging. And the 1.5 meter or 60 inch telescope is primarily for spectroscopic imaging. So you probably wonder why the Kepler's on here, other than it was on that really long list of stuff I said we owned <laughs> or worked on. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about why Kepler is in this presentation in just a second. And that is, this is an impressive number of stars. Um, does anybody remember when Kepler launched? March of 2009. And it just retired this last October. Um, October 30th of 2018, so in just, just over nine years, um, it observed 530,506 stars, but it didn't do that by itself. Okay, so our observatories did not work on the actual Kepler spacecraft, and we worked on another part of this project. So these types of projects require a lot of different people. So we do want to point out ahead of time, because we're going to talk a little bit about this, there's 2,662 planets confirmed from the Kepler mission, but over 3,200 left over that have not been confirmed. It observed them, it knows that they're out there. And these numbers are probably a little off as of today because NASA will probably update in the next couple of days. Uh, the EU catalog already updated. So we had 4,057 that last NASA count and the last EU catalog update was 4,118 uh, confirmed exoplanets. Um, so this thing, is why we were involved. So the Kepler spacecraft camera um, is a 90 megapixel, uh, I'll call it an array, or arrangement of CCD cameras. Okay, so each of these is an eyeball uh, or a plot. Um, so that is what we had to do. So this is a focal plane. It actually has uh, 42 CCD cameras uh, jammed in here and then several guiding cameras as well. So our job was to build this. It doesn't look very exciting. It's called the Kepler cam. And we also have a much smaller device about this big called the K2 cam. And we are still running these. This is a recent image. So we still use these because they help us to use ground-based spectroscopy and optical imaging to find targets. So when you have a really big spacecraft up in space and it relies on fuel, you don't just turn it any which way. Someone has to create this ahead of time. And we worked with the Space Telescope Science Institute to create the Kepler input catalog. And this is a very long, boring story about it's the Kepler input catalog and then it's the classification program, and then they select the target. So it's a funnel. Okay. So we observed in, these numbers are a little bit off because we're actually missing some of our data. Um, from the very beginning, from clear back in 2002, when we first started working on data input. So, so they're actually a little bit higher, um, which is why I have a roughly um, right here. So we have around 1,500 candidates observed and over 10,000 spectra obtained of those 1,500 candidates um, so that they could go into the classification program and be selected for the Kepler mission. Now, uh, I'm gonna show you sort of this is kind of what the Kepler input catalog looks like. So once we take all of our data and then we put it in a program, the sky sort of looks like this. And if you look here, you can actually see that's if the camera on Kepler were pointing into that region of the sky. And of course, Kepler was only made to look in a very uh, restricted field of view. It was only looking in our region of the Milky Way, so we had to be very precise. And so that's what all of these are. And so you can actually you see where things are that you recognize. Uh, M57, everyone loves M57. <clears throat> so uh, we could tell it to look in that direction um, as well. So they selected all of their candidates from here. And if you read down here, we've got, uh, we marked everything. We marked star magnitudes. And so this was a very intensive project. 
There's also another version of this that you can access yourself as well that comes on a black background with gold that you can use to see. And it's run by Google. So Google has taken all of this data and then repurposed it. So the reason Kepler Cam is really important and why we continue to use Kepler Cam is because of stuff like this. Does, does anybody hear about this in the news in the last few weeks on September 11th? Oh, yeah. Uh, K218b was confirmed. Is that the little tiny star, the giant planet? Uh, well, this is a very giant planet. It's very Neptunian in size. It's a super Earth. It was first discovered in 2015. But why we care about it an awful lot is this. So we already know that there's water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet. And I promised you I would tell you why I laughed about JWST for a second at the beginning. And it's because we need the JWST in order to better characterize this atmosphere of this planet and to know what it's really made out of and whether or not it could host life. So K218b is awfully close to its red dwarf star and that star is very active, which means it's pummeling K218b with radiation. And so if life exists on this planet, it's gonna be very different from life as we know it. It would have had to have mutated rather significantly, but we won't know until uh, JWST can get up there and actually do some work. So while we're still talking about exoplanets, these probably remind you of shoe boxes or hat boxes on a stick. And that's okay, because that's exactly what they are. <laughs> but these are the hat nets, and they exist on the ridge. Uh, Mount Hopkins, it's Fred Lawrence Wickle Observatory. They're a Princeton University project. Uh, we have HatNet North. There are five of them at our location. Uh, one of them is optical uh, reflector. One of them is an optical reflector. The rest of them are refractor telescopes. They're completely robotic. I've never met the scientists who run these. The telescopes themselves, the optical reflector opens up and decides whether or not they're going to observe all on its own uh, with its artificial intelligence program. And then they observe or they don't. Uh, then they tell the other two telescopes, which are in Hawaii on Mauna Kea, uh, whether or not they should observe that night. And what's uh, great about these telescopes is that that means they have almost 24 hours of seamless observation, which means they have fewer false positives uh, than any other ground-based exoplanetary mission. And they have discovered, these little shoe boxes, <laughs> have discovered uh, more than 70 exoplanets. Uh, they also look at variable stars, and I don't have that figure. Um, they don't publish that figure. but. Um, more than 70, and we're actually gonna talk about two of their uh, original finds in just a little bit here. Um, but so there are seven of them total. What's great about these, that you guys will all in this room appreciate this, is everyone an astrophotographer of some shape and form in here? Anybody? Sort of, sort of. my dad. Um, <laughs> so uh, my dad will really appreciate this. So all of these were built, and I want you to keep this in mind when we're talking about 70 exoplanets, okay? 200 millimeter cannons with an f-stop of 1.8 that's it off the shelf camera <laughs> and they are attached to ccds and that's it that's what's sitting inside of these little telescopes f8 did you say uh f1.8 f1.8 and that'll be really important too when we talk about uh hat p69 and hat p70 in a second uh, and now bringing up tests because we do work on the test mission and the reason I'm bringing up Tess right now is because she's very important to HAT P69 and HAT P70. And uh, Tess, current, whoops, I just ruined it. I ruined the surprise. Okay, so uh, Tess has 1,183 candidates. Um, Tess is currently about a quarter of the way through its primary mission, has a two year primary mission, and they expect that Tess will actually find 20,000 candidates uh, by the end of those two years. So, but we've already confirmed 29 planets using test data. The data is different, and so I'm actually gonna show you what it looks like, what the mapping from test looks like as well. Uh, 17,000 of the planets that test finds will be Neptunian or larger uh, in their mass. Can anyone guess why? Or do you just know why? <laughs> They construct more light from the yes. background star. Yeah, you're totally right. Uh, Tess is using the transit method, um, which I know you're all familiar with the transit method. And you're all going to watch the Mercury transit on the 11th of November. <laughs> Take great pictures. <laughs> um, 
So because it's using the transit method, the terrestrial planets are really, really hard to see, especially for ground-based missions. We're not finding a lot of those from ground-based missions on Earth because our vantage point often makes it almost impossible um, to see those terrestrial exoplanets. And then it is still difficult uh, when we've got tests because it's just not far enough away from Earth to be able to put it into a trajectory where we can see everything. Even though TESS has a very wide field of view and can observe 85% of our uh, our night sky of what we can see, it's still a little bit of an issue. So you're totally right. So, but this is why TESS was important and HATNET too. So we just discovered and September 11th was a really big day for exoplanets. <laughs> Right. Uh, a steaming pair of hot Jupiters. Okay. And if you are interested, so this was published in the Astronomical Journal. This is the graph. And this, uh, I have all of the resources on a screen at the very, very end. Um, so anything you want to be able to read uh, in full text later, you'll be able to do that. If you are not fully into all of the symbols the, the scientists use, I encourage you to go Google the news story instead. Go Google Phil Plate's version. Everybody know who Phil Plate is? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Go Phil Google Plate. Phil Plate's blog and he writes about this stuff. <laughs> much, uh, much easier. So, uh, these are blue <coughs> hot Jupiters, um, as I said. And hot Jupiters, the reason that they're called so is because they typically have a mass similar to or larger than the planet Jupiter in our own solar system. Hat P69, uh, which was found by HatNet uh, originally and then confirmed by our scientist, George Zhu, uh, in this paper. And about 3.58, the mass of Jupiter. And uh, since I'm not gonna try to give you that figure because Jupiter is already 2.5 times the mass of everything, uh, all the other planets in our solar system. So imagine that makes it, I think I decided about nine times the mass of all the planets in our solar system combined. So really big. Um, someone at Mount Lemmon likes to tell you how many caribou would fit in that. <laughs> you figure that out, <laughs> okay. Or how many washing machines would go across that planet. Um, I did not figure that out for you. Uh, Hat P70 uh, is a little bit too far away. There was some turbulence with the uh, HatNet, um, atmospheric turbulence. So we put it in a constraint at just under 6.78 times the mass of Jupiter. Uh, so that, uh, there's a little range of error on that. It's about a, a mass of one. Um, so they, uh, they were actually trying, this is sort of, they stumbled upon these and confirmed them on accident. They were really trying to determine the occurrence rate of hot Jupiters um, based on the information that we have and that we're getting from tests. And so this was just a little bit of fishing expedition. Very exciting for George and he is a doctoral student. So this is a really exciting moment for him. This is uh, what the light curve looks like for hat P69. <coughs> so you can sort of see uh, these are, these light curves are actually so uh, relative to the flux um, of the aperture um, against atmospheric turbulence. So you can kind of see occasionally things aren't, aren't where we want them to be. Um, and that's why that happens. Um, so the flux is actually against the uh, full aperture that HatNet can access, which is about 111 millimeters. So it's 111.111. Um, so brightness, uh, does everybody know what that means? Uh, relative flux. Um, so that brightness, uh, atmospheric turbulence is involved in that. It's also about the distance um, between the object um, and the observer. And so now I'm going to switch over to this. So this particular scientist also used the DSS-2, which is the Digitized Sky Survey Second Catalog, um, which does have public access, and I encourage everyone to use it. And if you really want to do a fun experiment, um, you'll go, put, well, where is it? Go pull up the paper, <laughs> read exactly what George said about how he found this data, and you can recreate this image for yourself. Um, so you can see that it is exactly the same. Um, only they have updated images. Um, so this catalog first was uh, finished in about 1999, and uh, but they have done some updates to it as well. And I, I ran this image myself just because I wanted to know. I was really surprised. So this is HAT P69 right here, and this is the full field of view around its star. This is what tests saw. 
say you can see this, uh, not as exciting as people might think. We're not taking a, a really elegant image of what's out there. <laughs> Uh, but but they use that through filtering to be able to determine structure and whether uh, what some of that atmospheric material might be and that's how they confirm um, using tests and so when they are able to combine all of these images together um, and all of that data that is how they make that happen so you can also access test data uh, right here and again these will all be at the end of the presentation as well so I've listed them in Full, in a full listing. If you ever have a problem, right? So scientists aren't gonna tell you the right ascension and declination. Uh, <laughs> that takes up a lot of paper space and they are limited. You can go say to the Exoplanet EU catalog or the NASA Exoplanet catalog and say, I need information on HAT P69. And you type it right in there and it will tell you everything you need to know. Where it's located, what system it's in, how many uh, planets are in its system. HAP P69 is a one planet planetary system. And so you'll find out all of that information. <clears throat> NASA is actually really cool. Uh, they make uh, illustrations of all of the confirmed exoplanets that they have in their catalog. And so you learn all about the atmosphere in that type of environment. Uh, EU catalog, if no one has used it, is a little more mystical in nature, um, but it gets right down to business. I do encourage you guys to do that and please uh, email me and tell me what your results were and, and what you thought of it. Uh, it's, it's a fun experiment. So the MMT, this is very beautiful. We have a scientist who's also a budding astrophotographer. His name is Igor Chilingarian. Um, and he took this image. So I've already told you a little bit about the MMT. So it was first built in the 1970s and I told you it had six tiny mirrors on it. And at the MMT, we do a significant amount of spectroscopy. And don't get me wrong, we do a lot of eight hour exposures of really beautiful things out in the night sky, like the Hortad Nebula, we like to do that. <laughs> when, uh, when there's time to put an eyepiece on it and just take an optical image, but mostly it is home to uh, the bino spec, hecto spec, uh, hecto shell, and you may have heard of hecto spec in the past if you are familiar with Margaret Geller and Redshift. And Hecto spec is her baby. It was the replacement for the Z machine uh, that you would have heard about in the 70s when we were first figuring out redshift. So, and then also the mirrors, which is the Magellan infrared spectrograph. So we do an enormous amount of that. And spectroscopy is how we figure out things. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna to talk to you about has been on my mind all week this week and for the last couple of weeks because it was news that was embargoed until Monday of this week. So you're actually seeing the science coming out and the news in the making. Uh, I have 18 more of them on my desk, so feel free to email me and say, hey, what's coming next? And I will sort of feed you tidbits of what I can say. Uh, legally, what I can say, I think I told Joe, it has to do with a supernova, because that says nothing. <laughs> um, so I'm calling them the slow to go. <clears throat> and is everyone familiar, or is anyone familiar with, um, what we know about light, uh, light curve, uh, light curve decline plateaus uh, in supernovas, in supernovae. So we use those to constrain hundreds of different cosmological models uh, in astrophysics. And up until Orgrar at the Center for Astrophysics uh, went on a fishing expedition, we thought only type 2p supernovae had a plateau and it maxed out at 100 days. And about 20 years ago, someone in the literature said, hmm, this supernova I'm looking at, it looks kind of weird, it's behaving funny, and then no one ever did anything about it. So, uh, Orr and Adam Reese, uh, anyone who's familiar with Adam Reese, he's a Nobel Prize Nobel winner in 2011, yes. mm -hmm, got together and had a conversation in 2015 because Orr saw something weird. He was looking at 2012 GC, that's a, or CG, excuse me, that's a supernova. And he said, this is acting funny, but I can't figure out why, because the optical imaging just isn't giving me a good view of this. Can I use your programs, uh, your infrared H-band programs on your Hubble Space Telescope time and go fishing and figure out what I'm looking at? And uh, 2012 CG is a type 1A supernova. So they looked at it together and they said, whoa, 
we're a thousand days out and there's still a plateau. So they started looking at other supernova, other type ones, and they discovered that at about 500 to 1,000 days out, these supernovae in the infrared were hitting a plateau, and it was lasting anywhere up to 350 days. So that completely blows all of the theories and cosmological models we had um, out of the water because it changes everything we knew. The optical imaging didn't tell us what we needed to know. It was holding a secret uh, because these are very far away. Um, I cannot actually remember how far away this is, but this is 2018 GD. Um, so they looked at this one, and it's actually right down here in the corner. And here is its galaxy. Okay, so you guys can figure that out. And then he also, uh, one of the other ones they looked at was 2013 DY. And so they figured that this was happening in multiples of them. So right now they have five confirmed uh, instances of this happening. 2012 CG wasn't a full confirmation because it was too far into that process already. So now they're going to continue observations and see if they can get more confirmations. The ideal number would be three. And so it took them about four years to find five of them, but now they know exactly what they're looking for. So they can go out and look for more and being watched through the door. Do they have a, a specific name for long plateau type one A? I think they're going to have to come up with one now. Oh, okay. well, <laughs> so no. this just out, we just put out this press release on go, Monday. Well. Yeah, we're going to call uh, them slow to go because that's what I made up for the presentation. Um, so well. they just <laughs> barely wrote the paper. Uh, I became aware of the paper in August. It was accepted in September and it just published on Monday. So this one, uh, as you, you notice back here, doesn't have draft access. And most uh, scientific papers take anywhere from four to six months to publish, so I find out about them in month two, and we have five months to figure it out. Um, this one uh, happened so quickly that, excuse me, they were not done writing it yet when it was already accepted. The, um, how can I get access to the uh, press release? Uh, I will show you, you how to, yeah, I can send it to you too. I can email it to you. So. Well, now that I've ruined the next surprise, so the MMT is also heavily involved in this, uh, which you may have heard an awful lot about because it was in the news for about three months. Um, it first came out in the news because they gave preliminary results at the APS conference in April. And uh, poor Anna Bonafa is a relatively new scientist with us and she was accosted by uh, media <laughs> at APS. We didn't know that was going to happen. So I'm saying dark matter throwing punches. Is everybody here familiar with stellar streams? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, a stellar stream was probably a globular cluster, and we think that GD1 uh, in our own Milky Way galaxy was a globular cluster, and they get stretched out as they come into the orbit of a galaxy. Okay, so they should be a thin stream of stars. Well, that's not quite what happened. Uh, with this one, let's see if I can get, nope, I can't get anything to work today. <laughs> work. Well, it's okay, fine. <clears throat> That's okay. It does not want to play for you, so I will just uh, skip over here. So what uh, Anna found, uh, looking at Gaia data, was gaps in there and this spur. And what that indicates is that something hit this stellar stream. Now, it could have been anything. She looked at all the nearby satellites. She looked at the Magellanic clouds, um, looking for anything that could have possibly caused this. Nothing. And so that leaves only one potential, the unknown. Going right into that science fiction realm and saying dark matter, but not just dark matter, because a cold clump of dark matter wouldn't necessarily have caused this big spur in the stellar stream. And so the new theory that uh, this team has developed is that there are certain types of clumps of dark matter that may be warm in their nature. And because we can't see it and we haven't found it yet, we don't, we don't know for sure. So what they did is they then said, okay, well, here's this hole and here's this hole. So we're now going to chase it in the direction we think it went. And we don't have an image for this yet, but they have found a similar looking 
perturbation in another stellar stream nearby, the Jalem stellar stream. And so they're starting to find evidence of this going on and along and along and along. <laughs> and uh, so they're tracking it. So they're trying to track whatever this thing is, this dark matter, whatever it is, uh, that caused these gaps and spurs um, in the stellar stream. <laughs> Hopefully they'll catch it. I think that would be a uh, Nobel Prize material. <laughs> and they did uh, just barely announce the Nobel Prize winners this year, and that was very exciting. Um, our original exoplanet uh, discoverers. Uh, okay, so again, the MMT, heavily involved in this. And you, uh, Joe, I know, heard about this uh, because he said something to me about it. Um, and so I call it the really hungry supernova. And this was also discovered by a young doctoral student as well, um, who has been watching this supernova not dissipate <laughs> um, for about three years. And it's not doing anything, it's just sitting there. But uh, so basically what this supernova did when it exploded was it completely ate its host star. It's gone, there's no evidence of that star left uh, to be found. So they know that it's a supernova, but they can't find the evidence of why it annihilated its star. Uh, which makes it very interesting, but it's not interesting just for that. It is also interesting because it is very far away from its host galaxy. Um, light years, hundreds of light years away from its own host galaxy. So it appears to belong to nothing. And so when they originally observed it, they couldn't figure out where it went. But the metallicity, uh, the brightness, the length of time that it's sticking around, uh, all of its content, uh, it has really low metallicity, so it's not fitting all of the models that it should uh, to be a standard supernova. So what they actually figured out is that it may be one of the very first observations of pair instability uh, supernova. Uh, supernovae, mm -hmm. excuse me. And so because we haven't had a really good observation of that in the past, this is very exciting uh, for scientists. And I guess I also forgot to tell you it also looks different in the spectrum. So <laughs> it's like, that's what we do there. So I probably should have said that. <laughs> it looks different in its spectrum. It's about 54,000 light years away from Earth, and it was 200 times the mass of our own sun. So if you can imagine that, uh, that explosion must have been rather significant. And so now they will continue to watch this supernova um, for quite some time, as long as it sticks around. That could be uh, so the name of the primary investigator principal investigator Sebastian Gomez, and he hopes to be able to observe it for three to five more years and continue to How update. How far away do you perceive it was? About 54,000 light years. Mm -hmm. So that's just outside the Milky Way. Yeah. Yes. So isn't there a theoretical limit to the size of supernovas being 100 solar masses or something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so this is so really that, weird that's because it's cheap. Yeah, this is really weird. <laughs> so he did it, everyone did not hear that, so the theoretical limit has been 100. So, so my, if you guys have the theme, the theme of this presentation is my scientists keep breaking theoretical models. Um, <laughs> um, and changing everything. So, um, so this is huge because it's double the size of the theoretical limit. And, and, and that is the plan. So they're gonna go look for more of them. And it's my understanding they may have found another one at this time, but I won't know for a few more months on what they've really found. What was its uh, maximum optical brightness? Do you know? Or I don't know, but I bet you the paper knows. Yes, that's okay. <laughs> I, uh, I always, just in case I don't know the answer to a question, that's why I say there's so, your paper. Did anybody see this thing? <laughs> yeah, did anyone see it? Did anyone, I mean, really, we should be able to see it now. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, and you can also see this was just recently as well. So they are changing science in this really uh, huge swath, especially for supernova, uh, supernovae. Uh, all of our uh, cosmological models are for supernovae are being changed in about two months. Um, I've heard repeatedly that no, low metallicity supernovae could happen from really high mass stars. But what was the metallicity like in that one? The, uh, the pure hydrogen stars. Well, 
very uh, early she population. She gave you the too. exact uh, numbers after this when we talked to you, and I'll, I'll pull up the paper and give you the exact numbers for it. Um, but it was really, really low. It was, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm only an armchair expert, right? I have to become an armchair expert in like what 900 people do for a living. Um, so and not all of them are supernovas. Um, but uh, uh, so I can't always remember stuff like that off the top of my head, but even to me, it was really low. What I know about the metallicity of stars, I said, so, that can't be right. And he said, yeah, that's what I said. And even in the, uh, all of the interviews that he gave to the news media, the biggest line that got picked up from the press release really was, I thought I did something wrong. <laughs> um, so he really did. He thought he did something wrong. Um, so you can actually see, uh, so we've got uh, September 2014 data when they first started looking. Um, and this is the uh, uh, low dispersion survey spectrograph. And they never observed through just one method. Um, but then this is what they saw again when they came back in July of 2018. Um, 50, and uh -huh. 54,000 light years from exposed galaxies. I think that's what I meant. That may be true. That, that right. Let's go back one and find out. I don't know. Maybe, uh, no, both. It may be both. Um, but, you know, they used multiple different cameras. So they used multiple telescopes at Whipple Observatory. And they used, multi they used the MDM. Um, they also used uh, PanStar, they used Gaia data. Um, they were really serious about confirming that this is actually what they were seeing and that it was true. So three years to publish? Uh, CSN 20116, that's it. Well, so they're, uh, they first started observing this particular supernova and the galaxy in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, but then these images just happened to be the 2014 image from the low dispersion survey and the 2018 image from the two's, uh, yeah. low dispersion survey. So, so I was um, just looking at the designation. So SN 2016. Yeah, so this is when it was confirmed. So this is its confirmation and naming date. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is when it was cataloged. Mm -hmm. So uh, they can see, uh, a lot of times our observers see things and they don't know what they're looking at so they don't catalog it right away. Um, or they need to go back and confirm it through several other surveys. And so that's uh, why they went back to PanStar. And, and they also used the Catalina survey as well. So they had to go back to several surveys to even get to a point where they could uh, catalog it. So did they actually go to some survey before the supernova erupted and they could see that there wasn't anything there? Is that how it worked? Um, so they can go back to data, uh, yeah. previous data. So yeah. they can go back to the catalogs PanStar, for example. So they can go back to PanStar. And look at that in the original Catalina survey. So were they so able to they figure out about when it erupted? That is in the paper too. He actually oh. does know that okay. um, for certain. It may not be in the paper. It may be something new. We'll double check together. Uh, sometimes it's not all of these are so new and so that's a that's one of the interesting things too. So sometimes when I tell you guys I don't actually know the answer to that it might not be in the paper because since this only published in August he has found new evidence and new information since then. So just since he finished the paper, he's been learning new things. And so I hear from him on about a weekly basis of what's going on in the new paper that he's working on as well. So I might be telling you information that I'm not <laughs> supposed to be telling you. <laughs> what, what type of supernova did you say it was? Uh, this one, I don't oh. know. So, uh, well, it's a, they feel that it's a pair instability uh, supernova. And so, right, you wouldn't know because there's never been an observation of one. So they were theorized in literature, but there's never been an actual observation um, of that theoretical model for a supernova. And so this would be the first one. Two very low metallicity old stars. Mm -hmm. Which would be very cool. Yeah. Um, if it, it turns out to be that 100%, that's their theory now. And so he's got about three more years to figure it out for sure. It's a, very, it's a long haul game. Some of these guys, uh, is everyone familiar with hypervelocity stars? So the guy who first uh, figured out those were real <laughs> um, as CFA, he's still studying them and it's been you know, 15 years. And so he's still looking at the same ones and getting new information out of them today. So, so the last one, these are my beautiful gamma ray telescopes. Uh, the Very Energetic Radiation Imaging Telescope Array System. Veritas does not stand for truth. 
It's just an acronym. Just hope. <laughs> and so we talked about gamma rays just a little bit. Um, if you guys are into citizen science, by the way, I'm the project manager on muon hunters um, from Veritas, which we need your help looking for muons in our telescopes because they make it really hard to figure out what's a muon and what's a gamma ray. <laughs> Um, when we get partials, um, and so we need human eyes to help us do that. Um, but so Veritas uh, was just completed in 2007, and actually it is scheduled to be decommissioned in about 2023 or 2024, because all of the dyes uh, will move to uh, the Atacama Desert, and they will go to the Cherenkov Telescope Array. But we may keep it. There's been three very impassioned papers, so if you access the archive, <laughs> you'll see some very impassioned papers in astrophysics about keeping these telescopes um, alive. They are sensitive in the 50 GeV to 50 PeV range, um, so they're some of the most sensitive in the world, and people come from all over, even when someone uses magic factor pests, uh, which are the other arrays out there for gamma ray, um, they always double check it on our telescopes. There are four of these, uh, so they surround our base camp museum, uh, which is kind of cool um, for us. There's 300 mirrors on every single one, um, and they, these are not individually actuated, <coughs> so they create a parabola. Um, right here, uh, the light comes straight down into the camera, back up into the mirror, you know, so it goes out, up, out, up, in, <laughs> um, to get that final smear. Um, across the windshield. They work as uh, an interferometer? They can. Yeah. Uh, there is a, so what this these holes are, where you don't see uh, mirrors, is where we have cabling to attach additional instrumentation. Uh, the CTA telescope is even more um, cool in that way. We can attach a lot of instruments to that one. I would assume that it's not easy with uh, short wavelengths. <clears throat> question for Garrett. <laughs> um, uh, and most of the time, so we don't always know what scientists who visit us are working on. Um, they are working on very secretive projects, so they'll hand us an instrument, they don't tell us what it does. Uh, we hook it on, they come, they make it work, and then they go and they do whatever it is they're doing, and I know when they publish a paper <laughs> uh, what they did with it. So um, what you're looking at here is light curves. Uh, everybody recognizes the light curve. Um, this is the light curve of something going in front of a star and something going away. You probably wonder why are you showing this to me after you showed me a gamma ray telescope? And that is because we're all familiar with using the moon uh, to block out the light of a, a star uh, in the night sky uh, to figure out how big that star is. But what if we're looking at the smallest stars in our night sky. We can't do that with the moon, right? Because when the moon's in front of it, it's gone. <laughs> uh, there's just no doing that. Um, it takes too long. So what the guys over at Veritas did was they said, okay, well, we're gonna sort out how to do this. And so they did it with an asteroid. <laughs> so they waited uh, a little while and they were very, very patient and they were observing TYC 5517-2271, which is a a star with a really long name. I don't know why we can't get to show the names. Um, and it was occulted by the asteroid Impruneta. And so since the gamma ray telescopes are so sensitive um, to small amounts of light, they were able to see this dip in the light curve. And so they were able to create this information and to determine the actual diameter of the stars. Impruneta was 60 kilometers in diameter. So it was just small enough out there in space um, that they're collecting about 300 images per second as well. So we have a long string of images to work with. And we don't always have that with our optical, our regular optical telescopes. And we determined the actual diameter of that star was about 11 times that of our sun. Then they did it again. Uh, um, by the way, I actually want to back up and tell you our sun is 864,340 miles in diameter, which means that that star that we see as one of the smallest stars in our night sky is 9,508,730 miles in diameter. <laughs> so really, really big. 
And then, uh, they, so they did it again in May of 2018 uh, with the asteroid Penelope, which is 88 kilometers in diameter. And another star, I won't give you the big long name, 700 light years away from Earth. And an earlier estimation of that star's diameter said it was 1.415 times the diameter of our sun. But we figured out it was 2.17 times the apparent diameter of our sun. And so they figured out this is actually a way that you can do this measurement and it can be very accurate. But of course, how often does an asteroid occult the star you want to look at? So it's not going to be something that we do on a regular basis. Um, but they did figure out it is possible. So you never know if magic hack, uh, hack, <laughs> magic, uh, no, I can't remember the names, <laughs> magic fact or hess <laughs> um, are going to do the same thing. Um, if they'll do similar studies and then when the CTA uh, array goes live with its 118 in the Atacama Desert, and I'm sorry, there's also about 20 of them that will go to the Canary Islands, so there's really, I said that wrong, 132 of them total, everyone can do that math, we're all, we're all good here. Um, so there will be two sets of them, Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, um, they might be able to dedicate time to that as well and they'll be able to look at more of the night sky because there's not just four. And we only did use, uh, you can see originally, we only used T1 and T2, which are two of the telescopes, and then they went back and turned T3 and T4 um, as well. That's the same, uh, the same star. Mm -hmm. Just under a couple of So they can, uh, those telescopes swing in about four seconds. So if they are already at azimuth, they can <laughs> break everything. Well, we now have to follow every asteroid into the cold, cold star. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's true. Make, make it a planet it scale, scale on the bottom there. <laughs> it is a really small yes. time scale. Oh, right. um, if everybody's looking, oh. looking at the time scale, very, well, it's only on the one side. I don't know what happened. Um, very, very small time scale um, for them. So uh, I actually right. am done. I did want to show you guys what the Schwarzschild Pige looks like. Uh, all of these mirrors are individually actuated, so you can see the direction of gamma ray astronomy is highly. And I'm a little over time, I'm sorry. Um, but this is one of my favorites. Telescopes on our site. It does very cool things. It's really fun to get your uh, reflection in. <laughs> very funky looking telescope. <laughs> it is a very funky looking telescope. So it was first... Uh, Somebody first proposed it as an optical telescope 114 years ago, and no one ever built it because it's a funny looking telescope. <laughs> and then a guy named Vladimir Vasiliev over at UCLA in their physics department said, that looks like it would make a great gamma ray telescope, let's build it. <laughs> and so he drew up plans for it, and he worked with the engineering department and his physics students, and they came up with this plan, and then we built it. And is uh, that's that in one? our backyard. Is that the one that was um, looking at the stars being occulted? Uh, no. So uh, this telescope is actually still in prototype mode. Oh. So it was uh, these ones oh, okay. uh, so that did that. So these are the traditional model for gamma ray. You're probably very familiar with that. You actually pass a picture of one uh, in the hallway mm -hmm. downstairs uh, with fewer mirrors. It's a much smaller version. Uh, that one. These are 12 meters uh, in diameter. Is there a U of U scientist involved with the development there of Veritas? There is. Dave Keita. Yeah, right. Oh, right. Yeah. Dave Keita is in the Veritas Consortium. Mm -hmm. He talked to. And he is also heavily involved uh, in the CTA project and has been heavily involved in building the instruments uh, that attach to the back of this telescope. So this is just observing the light of particles that the gamma ray is hitting. Yeah, the uh, explosions basically that happen in the atmosphere when gamma rays hit our atlas. Um, so yeah, squeeze. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so, so how does how does light get into that telescope? I don't. So uh, up here there is a hole, and um, light goes down into the primary mirror, shoots into the secondary mirror, which is right here. You can see the backs of all of the actuated mirror panels, oh, I see. and then collects back down. And the, what you see right here now, there's no camera on this telescope because it had not been inaugurated yet. This telescope was just inaugurated in January of 2019. And it just had first light in 
March, March of 2019. So we've only been testing it. I'm it's still just history. trying to wrap my head around the design. That's all. It is. <laughs> it's a very um, strange design. It's a big secretary of strength. It reminds me of the Clemens scope. It does. It seems like it, but it works really well. I mean, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you cover it? I mean, how do you protect it from rain? So, um, uh, all of our telescopes, uh, well, you can actually see, so I'll point back to this one. These are not covered. These are not in domes. Gamma ray telescopes are open to the elements at all times. Um, so one of the big things with this one, uh, since these mirrors are these mirrors are actually about this thick, um, and their honeycomb structures are inside, all of their electrical components are inside of each mirror, and we are learning. This is a prototype, so um, what we are doing is we are the pathfinder for the entire CTA. Um, so everything bad that happens to this telescope, which there's a significant amount of bad happening to this telescope, <laughs> um, we figure it out and we fix it before they start building them in the Atacama oh, Desert. And we're very similar. We're an analog environment. Uh, we get plenty of snow, um, ice, dust storms, birds, um, all sorts of animals, pests. Um, so <laughs> we're the perfect analog environment. Um, at our facility for that. You Some of the these pigeons mirrors. In the antenna? We have not had pigeons in our antennas okay. and they will not be in the Atacama Desert either, so that's okay. Right. But uh, some of these mirrors um, are actually experiencing bubbling and peeling. Um, so the, uh, the elemization is peeling off of the front of the mirror, which is not common. So that's a problem that we have to solve. Joe, um, can you grab the, uh, the list of sets from where we put it on the. Oh, yeah. Can, yes. you, can you send yeah. that to me? I will. I can't write them down that fast. Well, and I, I will, can't read my writing. I, I can photo. Well, I will um, so. send you the whole presentation. Oh, I will great. And I choose pictures for this? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I think photos. So I maybe Paul them. needs to get upstairs since it's after everything. Nobody's here. There's some people standing in the hall. Oh, are they? There's like four of them. <laughs> Tell them to come in. They were listening to me and I felt yeah. special. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, so when you do go through the list, um, like I said, there's always public access and you guys can feel right. free to ask me questions and I will either find the answer or I will find the person responsible for the question um, and have them answer you. Well, we are so very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Proud of your daughter. Oh, yeah, she's so knowledgeable. Amazing. And I, you convinced me even further that astronomers are the hippest people in the universe. Yeah. We are hip people. Yes. Absolutely. Nerd is a euphemism for yeah. way too cool. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, too. I got called a nerd a lot when I was young, and I'm like, yeah, but now look what I do. Okay. Help yourselves to these little pamphlets about the uh, dark side. The Help yourselves to some crackers with cheese. And Dave, are you going to the village inn? Yes. Well, I think some of us, some of us are going to the village inn for chat and dinner afterwards. And we sure would like to see everybody there. It's at 9th, 9th East, and 5th South. 4th South. 9th East and 4th South. Curvy Hill.